Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased that uh, I have the opportunity to uh, give this presentation, uh, which is video recorded, uh, having as a subject, as you can read, rock mass characterization. And uh, I will uh, uh, mainly focus on uh, the, uh, this characterization as an engineering geology tool uh, for design purposes. So this is in the uh, context and the frame, trying to quantify uh, geological objects, issues and items, in order to proceed uh, to put numbers and uh, uh, to proceed to the design. Uh, design needs numbers uh, and design of uh, structures uh, over and in the ground uh, needs numbers uh, to be put in geology. I will give a special emphasis on uh, the application limitation of this uh, characterization, and uh, mainly I will speak, the majority of the lecture, the main bulk, even more of the lecture, uh, will be on GSI, the Geological Strength Index. And I will give a, a, a series of uh, limitations that uh, come from uh, the experience of uh, this uh, index as it has been used uh, so far. Well, this is uh, the structure of the presentation. After a short introduction, we go to uh, try to see how we can define the properties and uh, the geological strength index, uh, how it's uh, made in order to help this procedure. The role of this, of this index. And then the third uh, Part uh, will be the suggestion in using uh, GSI, the limitation, because we have experienced a number of misuses or erroneous uses of uh, uh, this uh, index, as in all cases of similar practices. And then <coughs> the fourth chapter is uh, a particular family of, uh, of ground, the heterogeneous and complex masses with a uh, lithological variety, which are very <coughs> difficult to be assessed. And uh, I will describe how we can approach uh, this assessment in putting numbers. And also uh, the case of anisotropic masses, which will be discussed also in the previous uh, subject. And conclusions. So coming from with the introduction, a general layout, uh, the assessment of ground in the design for engineering construction. Uh, first of all, the beginning always is the beginning, and the beginning is geology. We have to establish the geological model. If we do not do it from the very beginning, uh, all the consequent uh, analysis uh, will be much labor in vain. Uh, it means uh, collect uh, geological data, conditions, uh, and then translate them uh, into an engineering geological description. Having done that, we go from the forest to the tree. And this is the ground model. We have to define the ground type, which means properties. But in order to get properties, we have to uh, understand the behavior of this ground mass under the conditions of the uh, structure of the construction. And obviously, this is associated with the environmental conditions, in situ stresses, and ground water. <coughs> this, we have uh, now uh, the properties, and we have to select the appropriate geotechnical parameters and the suitable design, uh, criteria for the design. And we proceed to the design using either empirical or analytical or much more today, most recommended numerical methods. And we close with the construction implementing the design. So this is uh, in words uh, the same, uh, the slide uh, describes the same things uh, that uh, geological conditions, properties, design, construction. Uh, the 
traditional role of, uh, of geology, the engineering geology, uh, was in the past uh, terminated somewhere there. But uh, the need today and the development of uh, construction and of engineering geology uh, has uh, come in order to have uh, the engineering geology now to be also a part of that section where we get properties and also to be present in the design in order to ensure that calculation and simulation do not misinterpret the geological reality. So this is really the challenges of uh, today engineering geology. So for the design of engineering structures, we need to know on the quality of the material. It means numbers, properties. And I come now to the second chapter, properties and selection of design parameters. Our material we have to deal with. I stay always with rock. This was very obvious from the beginning. No soils in this presentation. We have the quality of the intact rock. But the intact rock, uh, after its genesis, did not stay as such today. There is a history, a geological history, uh, which uh, affected, and uh, we have a, a rock mass today. It means we have a fabric of this initial rock, a structure. And then these are governed by discontinuities. And uh, these continuities have a, a quality on their surfaces. So the intact rock, the fabric of the mass, and the quality of these continuities make what we call a rock mass. <coughs> All these. Uh, elements of uh, the rock mass, the intact rock, the fabric, and the discontinuities depend from the geological history. So the geological background is not finished, it's always there. Having done the geological <coughs> prediction section, the geological model, uh, the task is not finished. The rock mass is governed by this geological history. Genesis, for instance, the intact rock is reflected on the quality of the intact rock and the inherent structures. The tectonic evolutions <coughs> give the fabric and the quality of joints. And the recent development, the paleogeographic evolution, reflects on the weathering and the final fabric. Well, the rock mass. Uh, this is a strong rock mass, an undesired. Uh, uh, the joints are clearly seen. And we have, you can see, small blocks, which, and I will speak about that, uh, which are separated by the joints. They are tightly connected, and everything, the stability and the failure, depends on uh, this uh, interconnection. And uh, uh, when we go to failing, we have a kind of, we need a kind of rotation or sliding of, the, of these blocks. Uh, this can be considered reasonably as a, a, a isotropic. Uh, uh, homogeneous rock mass, and uh, the question is how we can simulate this mass, which is difficult to uh, test uh, as it is, to a, another mass, quite homogeneous and continuous, uh, having lower strength values. This is another case. Here is a deformed sedimentary sequence of sandstones and sealstones, the fleece. Uh, which, due to the compression, is completely disorganized, is almost chaotic, and uh, uh, the contact and the interlocking is almost lost. So we move from these initial uh, conditions of uh, mechanics, and we have to deal also uh, with these uh, special conditions, which correspond to worst cases, because here the rock mass is uh, obviously weak. Well, let's see what we have in nature to find uh, as a rock mass in which or <coughs> on which we have to construct our structure. Intact rock with a uh, few discontinuities, uh, massy rock with a few sets of discontinuities, much more jointed rock mass. The same here, but some uh, discontinuities may persist, 
like in a bedding, uh, thin bedded sequence or histology frame. Uh, this is a completely disintegrated uh, rock mass. And this is shear laminated. The structure is lost. And uh, we can see here, for instance, uh, the, the behavior. Uh, this, this is usually strong rock, brittle, elastic, and generally isotropic behavior. Here, obviously, the rock mass is anisotropic. And uh, um, everything depends on the, uh, the stability on the shear strength and the orientation of the main discontinuities. And little by little, we start to have a, a conditions that can be considered approach or be reasonably isotropic uh, as uh, uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, boxes. Uh, but uh, we do not uh, uh, stop there. In nature, we have also these uh, particular formations, heterogeneous rock masses, and quite often. Uh, either alternations of combatant and non combatant rock, by definition isotropic, but which may become reasonably isotropic due to microfolding and compression, uh, or how the chromasses melange, uh, melange of hard and uh, soft rock, which mix with soil, which can simulate the isotropic. So I will not deal with these two first boxes. I will go from these to the lower level. So how we define numbers, how we uh, estimate uh, rock uh, mass property strength and uh, deformation, modulus of deformation. Why? At the beginning, of course, guess. Uh, we judgment based on experience. And then we have... Uh, Maybe problems, failures, uh, or problems which add to the experience, which improve judgment, and so on and so on. Uh, of course, laboratory testing, but can, can we do laboratory testing here? For research purposes, we may have a prototype a machine in order to test, but this is not the case for the practice and everyday experience. In situ testing is a very expensive procedure cannot be applied uh, in all cases. And uh, in tunneling, for instance, the tunnel is not yet there when you make the study. For <coughs> certain particular purposes, like for an arch dam, it is a must to do so, to do so, not to rely to uh, some approaches we are going to speak about. But anyway, this is back analysis, by all means, is the best. But again, <coughs> can we do back analysis when nothing is there? We can rely for in, in cases when we have slopes, construction on slopes, <coughs> linear structures, but again. So uh, the rock classifications with, which were in the, let's say, in the geotechnical uh, market uh, already, uh, uh, mainly after the, from the 60s, but mainly after the 70s, um, established for other purposes uh, could be used and it was used in order to give an estimation of Iraq mass properties. So classification came to give a solution to be a tool for that. And of course, as I underlined, appropriate use, intelligent use expert use. Uh, speaking about classification, uh, since it's something that is uh, ongoing, and why it's ongoing? Maybe because this material is still too unknown to us, the ground material. We far away to understand, fully understand the laws. And so we try to correlate based on experience. And, uh, on back analysis. And still, these uh, classifications are so useful, provided again are carefully used. So, these are the rock classifications for uh, different purposes. Um, and Terzaghi is well known, the Kalidi description of rock mass, the first classification in order to define the dead loads over a tunnel, still in use today. Uh, Dear, the rock uh, quality designation, RQD, which was 
uh, to move forward in order to put in numbers in geology. Wickham and Al, a quite intelligent and nice system, RSR, but not well, uh, not well established worldwide, although very well linked with geology also. And Gignasky and Barton, the most uh, well-known classifications, rock mass rating, rock mass quality, which were established for uh, the, in order to give a single shot um, the recommendations for supporting and reinforcing uh, ground uh, and the ground structures, although we have the extensions uh, to application to other uh, structures like uh, slopes. Hook and Brown come with the geological sand index uh, in the middle of uh, 90s, the GSI, and uh, together with uh, uh, colleagues, uh, collaborators, so this is the course of development uh, of uh, the GSI as it stands today. Palstrom proposed the rock mass index, and uh, this year will be published, not yet published, Aidan et al. and his collaborators, Olusai and others, uh, which will, uh, we are proposing a rock mass quality rating based on RMR, but focused to define uh, properties. So the majority of these are for uh, other purposes. The GSI uh, index is in order to define, is not for design, is define parameters for the design, not go directly to an uh, em empirical or approximate design. So all these, uh, except GSI, uh, all these uh, uh, classifications, as said, uh, although established uh, for other purposes, uh, giving recommendations for the support design in tunnels, uh, they were and are quite used in order to define parameters. With the development of uh, the extremely powerful microcomputers and uh, the user-friendly software of today, uh, this became a higher demand for more accurate input data related to the rock mass properties, go to the properties, as an input into the numeric analysis or to simple uh, solutions by closed form equations. And this necessity led to the development of a different set of rock mass classification, the geological index as already reported. And this is such classification. What well, there is, we see in, in the, uh, we say classification or characterization. Uh, uh, the people like to say characterization if uh, you use uh, the, uh, this kind of classification in order to define uh, parameters uh, for, uh, in order to, to enter in the design. And uh, yes, this was uh, to, uh, in order to assist the Hook and Brown failure criteria. Established for isotropic rock mass and uh, uh, introduced uh, late 70s and evolved so far. And quite a number of years from then, it stands today. Uh, I was Hook uh, was saying, uh, often lay, I, I, when we proposed this with Hook and Brown, we expected uh, to have something uh, to improve that. and. Uh, uh, to be more developed, but still we are there. It means that it works. The original concept, which still, considers the failure deformation process to be based on the interlocking uh, of the angular blocks of the intact strong rock. When these blocks are small enough, considering the scale of the problem, we consider the rock mass can be approximately considered as a homogeneous isotropic a mass, continuous mass, and the behavior is controlled uh, by the uh, freedom of the inter blocks to slide, to rotate, or rare to fail because it's strong rock. So this uh, I, can be simulated to something of a lower strength, but to be continuous. The Hook and Brown failure criteria, as it stands today, for the isotropic rock mass, uh, in terms of principal uh, effective stresses, 
uh, is tightly linked with the geological observation. And this is a major advantage of uh, this failure. MSA depends on the geological conditions of the intact rock quality and the fractures and condition of joints. Initially, MSA were estimated through RMR because when Hook and Brown established this criterion, RMR was there available. And by modifying in order to remove the factor, the factor of water, since water is taken into analysis in the American model, or the orientation of uh, some joints, considering as a tropic, some modification, uh, it was used. It worked well in the medium frame between RMR 30 and uh, 70 under moderate such conditions. But it was found that it was difficult to apply to rock masses of poor quality, where the RMR classification, as uh, Kenyaski himself said, had not uh, so many data for those, and it's not uh, even by him recommended to the very, very poor quality. Then the new classification system came the GSI. Today, M, A, and S are derived from GSI from the 2002 edition. The questions are uh, depending uh, GSI and so on. Uh, in 2002, uh, the D factor, which is a very important factor, was introduced. This is the degree of disturbance of the rock mass due to the blast damage or relaxation if you are, we are close to the surface or close to a very disturbed zone. Zero is for undisturbed rock mass, one for very disturbed rock mass. Uh, in normal civil engineering construction, we have a smooth blasting with a careful blasting. Uh, um, the D factor is, goes to zero. In a mining blasting, where we don't care too much, open mind, we, 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 we want to, to move as much as uh, uh, possible of the rock mass. We, we, we uh, in purpose, uh, have uh, this kind of blasting, and we uh, reach uh, one. Also, in uh, close to the surface, uh, construction close to the surface has a more disturbed uh, uh, Roma, rock mass uh, conditions and we have to. Uh, well, D is a very important factor in terms of its, its sensibility. You may have quite a difference in your results uh, by not choosing uh, the right uh, D factor. And we see some uh, misinterpretation uh, that, uh, uh, in the application uh, due to this fact. MI is linked with the intact rock itself. Uh, it, uh, it, is, uh, it reflects the tensile uh, strength of the rock mass, the, how the grains of the, the crystals of the intact rock are well interlocked, uh, cemented, how it's a kind of <coughs> reflecting the internal friction. And uh, uh, this can be easily uh, found by triaxial test, which is recommended. Uh, in case of uh, not possibility, having a price less or for a first approximation, this uh, table uh, can be used uh, when you have the classification of sedimentary metamorphic rocks and, uh, and, uh, and uh, plutonic rocks also, depending on their uh, fine or uh, coarse grained uh, nature, uh, and, and so on and so on. Uh, the English rocks. Uh, so uh, you uh, get so this uh, value, which is uh, among the other parameters, which uh, makes uh, the whole uh, system less uh, sensible. GSI developed and evolved uh, since '94, where Everett Cook, and then after that, uh, together with uh, Brown. <laughs> Uh, developed in 1995, uh, based on practical experience, field observations, and back analysis so far from that period today. Practical experience, field observations, and back analysis to today, and it stands. GSI for joint hydromasis, as it is today, it was presented in 2000. 
Uh, and uh, this is uh, the chart applied today, the basic chart. Uh, you have two fundamental factors, the structure, as we have described already. And uh, as you go down, you have a, the uh, interlocking uh, uh, is decreased. And the second parameter, the columns, the surface conditions for the very rough joints to the very poor silica science joints. So please note the qualitative nature of the description of these states, which respects the geological conditions and constraints. You see, for instance, here there are boxes uh, with uh, the indication non-applicable. Uh, you cannot find in nature uh, these cases. Well, this is a kind of problem, however, because non-experienced uh, people, uh, mainly uh, with not much experience on uh, geology, uh, engineering geology, uh, may find difficulties in defining the appropriate location in the chart. Whether, whether in other, in other <coughs> classifications, they can measure the items which form the classification. We will come back to that. Together with Herbert Hook, we resisted to put internal numbers to this chart in order not having this essence of geology to be lost. But uh, no way. Uh, and uh, there are a proposition from Herbert Hook and uh, his collaborators, we will see, to put some numbers and we'll make some comments. So just an example, this is a typical joint rock mass, three, mainly three joints of, you can see anisotropic, in, 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 but in, as a whole can be considered as isotropic. We are somewhere there, provided you believe me that I was there and I touched the conditions. Because you can get the, from a nice picture the texture, but you cannot do GSI as any other classification from the luxury of your office. Uh, you have to go and touch. You must touch. You must develop this kind of close contact with the ground anyway, whatever uh, you build with on it. You must really, let me say, develop a kind of erotic correlation with the ground. And then the ground uh, will give back, will respond positively. Well, here is obviously anisotropic, but uh, initially, but look at the tectonic deformation. So we can find somewhere, not necessarily to be fixed in a box, but in between, somewhere there. And this is the worst case. It is here, the, the, the white bands are not a, a rock, a rock. it's the prickets of flakes of the shale by the teeth of the excavator, the backhoe. You need a, here again an excellent, very conscientious, very experienced driller in order to get this kind of, of, of course, uh, to be able to give a reliable uh, core for putting number on this rock. So once GSI has been selected, the system become, uh, becomes highly qualitative, quantitative. And then GSI can use a simple into numerical analysis or closed form solution. Uh, I repeat again that uh, GSI is not intended as a replacement of RMR or Q, since it has no rock mass reinforcement capability. And I will uh, stress this back again. Uh, in uh, further in this presentation. Its only function is the estimation of rock mass properties. To come from uh, the intact rock to the rock mass, the strength of the intact rock to the rock mass. Now this is the, let's say, the, the physical meaning. We have a, a mass which can be considered as isotropic, but uh, very fractured by condition, and how much we have to uh, reduce the initial strength. 
how much. So through the geological selling index, through the petrographic index MI, we get how much this reduction is to be taken into account. <coughs> for instance, for a GSI, let's say <coughs> a rock mass broken around, uh, jointed around 40, and the sigma CI about uh, uh, sandstone about uh, uh, 100 MPA. Uh, the sandstone is, uh, is about 17, somewhere there, and uh, we get 0 0.2. The ratio of the laboratory test, the 100 MPI to the rock mass strength, so 20%, uh, 20 MPI. Uh, from 100 MPI, and now with this jointed sandstone, in such a way to have a GSI 40, the rock mass, in order to put in the calculation, is 20 MPA. Uh, an issue is that a lot of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of uh, software are written uh, in terms of more Coulomb, since uh, not the, it is not the case uh, today uh, generally, uh, because uh, we have the software to have uh, uh, Juan Brown uh, inherently inside the software, but also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of us uh, uh, are familiar uh, are with the uh, Coulomb cohesion and friction of angle. Uh, a nice exercise was done in uh, 2002. And in order to find the equivalent cohesion and friction angle, depending on the sigma 3. Uh, and uh, um, so you can, you can find where your sigma 3 in your case is in order to select the appropriate cohesion and friction angle. Uh, well, this can be, uh, 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 is given by the program Rock Science, uh, Rock Lab of Rock Sciences, which can be downloaded free, and uh, you get the values of cohesion. Now, uh, the modulus. Uh, the modulus, the formation modulus, uh, is not directly related to the Hogan and Brown failure criterion. There is, uh, we know, it is not independent, however, of the strength. And we recall the old uh, correlations, like the modulus ratio MR, uh, correlating the strength with the uh, modulus of elasticity, the formation modulus. There is, a, of course, a kind of F correlation. Uh, but uh, um, since uh, the modulus is an important uh, parameter in any analysis, including uh, the formation, uh, the GSI can provide an approach to this modulus, uh, initially proposed uh, by Everett Hook uh, and the collaborators in 2002, uh, which has not, is, not, uh, is not much relevant because it's not a sigmoid uh, curve. And then uh, having a big amount of uh, uh, in-situ uh, data, uh, Hock, uh, Herbert Hook and Mark Diedrich presented in 2006 two formulas, two other formulas. Uh, I present that one. The other one is much more simplified, uh, which again is very much related with the disturbance factor. Well, I think uh, personally that still uh, is needed work to do here. Uh, because we find, <coughs> uh, provided we use appropriately the uh, uh, GSI and the D factor, uh, we find that uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, low, G low, 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 low uh, modulus when we have a low GSI and a low sigma CI. Too much conservative. Low GSI and low sigma CI, the intact strength, uh, means we are in the very bad geological rock mass conditions, and uh, uh, the, the result is somehow too conservative, in my understanding. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, it is recommended to have site-specific correlations uh, when you uh, have your work and uh, uh, you apply construction. So in order to conclude this chapter, uh, uh, having sigma CI, the intact, uh, rank, in, intact strength of the rock, the uh, modulus uh, of the formation of the intact rock, the petrographic index MI and GSI, we have put numbers to this, uh, to the rock mass, we have the ID, 
of the rock mass considering isotropic go to analysis. Thus, the geological interest has considerable potential for use in rock engineering uh, because, as it is, uh, you can read, it permits the manifold aspect of rock to be quantified and has a geological logic and reducing engineering uncertainty, which is quite important. Its uh, use allows the influence of variables, which ma makes make up a rock mass to be assessed and has the behavior of rock masses to be explained more clearly. This also allows, as we will see in the, in the further chapter, uh, to extend this uh, GSI chart to other particular geological formations. Suggestions to use GSI and limitations. Not only the sketches in the boxes, but also the description. There are detailed descriptions in each box which has to be taken into consideration. Again, I say this because uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some people not experienced, some difficulty to, to assign because numbers in this stage are missing. The air observation. Well, this is a question of scale. A scale of the potential failure in relation with the size of the engineered structure. And this is a good example. This is the Chuchicamata big mine in Chile. Uh, in, uh, at the scale of the benches, uh, the stability is obviously structurally controlled by specific joints. GSI and Hooker Brown is, are not applicable. At the big scale, at this uh, 500 meter high slope, the rock mass can be treated as homogeneous and uh, the rock mass classification can be used. Obviously, GSI also. The same is true for the tunnels. We have a big uh, chamber uh, and uh, the, uh, a, a, small, a, a normal uh, diameter tunnel and uh, uh, the frequency of uh, the joints. You may have to choose different criteria. Well, this is the Utah mine, which uh, an unfortunate failure happened last year. Well, in tunnels, this was the outcrops uh, I mentioned, so in all the slope. The, in the tunnels, we have the uh, we have restraints in formation, we have the boreholes, and we must make an intelligent, and again, uh, experience is very much important here, to extrapolate from the almost 1D information from the borehole to the 3D needed. Geological judgment is quite important. For the tunnels, the rock mass that carry the loads is to be considered where to, uh, for the GSI to be selected, and by all means, in all cases, mean values uh, are meaningless. Water, quite important factor, but when, when working uh, in uh, uh, the fair to very good categories, it means these two and part of the third columns, uh, uh, the Roughness is quite uh, strong. This, uh, there is no any kind of infilling of films of weak material, uh, which could be affected by the water. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, must, must not the water take into consideration because the water pressure is dealt with uh, by the effect of analysis later on. So there is no need to penalize twice the rock mass. Uh, on the contrary, here, the water may affect also the quality of these continuities because this is the fair to poor, very poor qualities, which are poor, why? Because they are uh, weak minerals, which may uh, have a, a reduction of their strength uh, by the presence of water. Uh, rocks of low strength in a post-tectonic environment. Uh, these are simple structures with few discontinuities. Don't try to put the GSI there, 80 or 90, because there is one discontinuity there or another there. Go directly with lab tests. This is not a jointed rock mass. 
GSI is for a joint network mesh. Aperture of discontinuities. This is close to the surface or close to very disturbed four zones in depth. And as mentioned, the factor D can give some help provided it's used <coughs> correctly. In grape depth, we go to, uh, we shift to the, uh, to the left and to the up in the chart in order to reach uh, GSI 100 and have completed under <coughs> different mechanics. Discontinuities with filling material. This is described in the poor and very poor conditions if you have in, in fillings in, in, in the joints. The weathered rock mass. If it is completely weathered, don't try to apply GSI. Uh, this is a, a soil mechanics material. But uh, if it is slightly weathered or med moderately weathered, you can do that. And uh, then you have to move to the, to the right because uh, the weathering affects mainly the discontinuities. Here, which was not the case, is not the case in the stroke rock masses which are not weather, uh, uh, you may have also to change MI and sigma CI because the intact rock is affected by weathering, provided you know how much is affected. Uh, uh, again, this is a chart, uh, uh, the GSI chart, where you see that uh, uh, by Vasilis Marinos uh, uh, in his PhD uh, from uh, many tunnels uh, in Gnesis and uh, Micasis, uh, uh, which uh, there is a shift of the, of the curves in order to, uh, and also in order to, to face, uh, uh, to put numbers in such rocks uh, like Gneiss granites, uh, which uh, suffer from weathering, and these columns, uh, these columns are uh, marked, uh, uh, followed the SRM classification of weathering, from sound to the very weathered, and you see areas where this is not suggested or cannot be found in practice. And isotropy, this is a most important issue. GSI applies in isotropic media. And G GSI, if the failure does not follow a preferential direction, when you have a failure for its own slope. I will come to the second issue later. Well, an example. This is the same rock mass type in both valley sites, same GSI. Here GSI is applicable and the Hook and Brown failure criteria. If the failure will happen, we'll go through the rock mass involving different joints, families of joints, and also the intact rock itself. The other, although we have the same GSI, GSI is meaningless. And the Barton, Barton, this failure criteria along joints is to be applied. Again, the same picture, here is applicable. Here is not applicable. But this kind of slope and given the nature of this ground, at the limit can be applied because the bedding planes are, do not favorize stability. Here, of course, is not applicable. It's meaningless to see GSI. Here, again, <coughs> the instability is structurally dependent, the wedge. Now, regarding the deformations, clear influence by the anisotropy. But this does not mean that Hook and Brown cannot be applied to anisotropic rock masses, provided that the, the dominant discontinuity, uh, the sets, are modeled at model explicitly. These discontinuity sets that are significantly weaker, as I mentioned, than the rock blocks that they separate and usually are the bedding planes or historicity planes. So uh, the commercial software of uh, finite models of continuous medium allow to put joints, although we have the other more specific <coughs> software. Uh, and other exercise we have made with my uh, 
uh, master students and the, uh, is to try to, uh, to face an uh, isotropic rock mass and uh, uh, using GSI and so. What we did, uh, we, this is the stratified, stratified rock mass. We split in two the internal rock mass without the persisting bedding planes or schistosity planes and the persisting weakness of the surface. We go through this analysis. The deformation <coughs> depends on the location on the uh, location of the bedding place, the anisotropy orientation regarding, in this case, the tunnel. Uh, this is uh, uh, calcist, a kind of phyllite, uh, over the uh, torino leon uh, uh, base tunnels in uh, San Martin Laporte. France. And uh, here uh, you see this uh, anisotropy and you see also the anisotropic appearance of the deformation. Later, deeper enough, we have the big coverages in this, in, in this tunnel, uh, faced now, of course. So uh, the, the, the results, uh, this is the discontinuity, this is the discontinuities in these cases which we face, poor discontinuity, very poor good discontinuity. Uh, uh, the reference rock mass, um, so the GSI, uh, the internal rock mass, the GSI is higher, but this is removed, and this is lower, depending also on the position in the chart. You see the differences are not the same. And this is the discontinuity itself with uh, the <coughs> Barton uh, parameters, JRC, JCS, and the distance, uh, the, the displacement and of course this slope uh, psi of uh, of uh, this uh, orientation of this uh, continuities and this is the result uh, we see that uh, depending on the angle alpha which is depending on the depends on the orientation and the position uh, consideration of the of the tunnel. This is the orientation of the bending planes and the position, uh, the consideration of the position of the tunnel, where we consider the deformation. Uh, you see that we are okay uh, in uh, most places, but uh, we rise to almost twice the deformation calculated uh, uh, when uh, we get uh, and everything is done considering everything isotropic. Uh, instead of having any consideration, as we have to do consider, uh, considering the real conditions, anisotropic. So this ratio goes to two, which is too much. Uh, but again, this depends uh, on uh, where you are in the chart. This is the GSI 35, okay, but 35 goes like that. You have here the weak rock masses, uh, weak uh, discontinuities, and here you have strong discontinuities. And uh, then you see the difference <coughs> is 20% more, and here is 80% more. Sigma Xi is uh, ideally is to, uh, to use a laboratory test, of course, uh, but sometimes you cannot estimate very attention. And this is mainly when you have disturbed systose rock masses, when the intact rock components are masked. There is a tendency uh, to, 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 to give uh, uh, lower values when you uh, someone see the uh, rock mass which is here to the intact rock. I repeat, not to use GSI for direct recommendation for support in tunneling. It is not intended to use, uh, to, to be used as, like uh, RMR and Q, as a tool to uh, estimate the support requirements. As a first approach, although not recommended, you can do that, but this must be coupled, associated with Sigma Ci, this and strength, and the C2 stresses. For instance, <coughs> you can do that as a first approach. This is quite recommended. The rock mass strength over in situ stress, you have found this through GSI, and you can have an estimation of the strain of the formation of the tunnel. So through GSI, you get a very good initial idea where you are. Good conditions, moderate conditions, very bad squeezing conditions. This is easily done from the very beginning. And then you go to the design. 
Now, the quantification of the GSI parameters is a question of uh, subjectivity, as I mentioned, for many to, that uh, apply. So a first attempt to a proposition to uh, have a quantification was done by Kai Kaiser in, in 2004, and then by Giordani Russo from, from Torino. Uh, in uh, um, uh, 2013, in the American Rock Mechanics Congress, uh, Everett Hook, who is Trevor Hafter, and Mike and Mark uh, Diedrich presented this quantification. You see, the upper box and the lower box are missing because the interlocking issue is not applicable. And you have uh, the, uh, this, uh, the joint conditions as proposed by Bgenyavsky, which can be measured in the classification of, of Bgenyavsky, the joint conditions, and this is the RQD. Well, in my understanding, the problem is how you can easily define RQD uh, reliably, because here you may have also, you need an experience person to do that. But so uh, this is anyway proposed and done. And uh, personally also, I am happy for that. Uh, since uh, the uh, complex and weak uh, rock uh, mass are not involved where the uh, original, the charts, the normal charts have to be used. So I mentioned that. And now this chapter going to, approaching the end, cases of heterogeneous complex and uh, very particular uh, rock masses with mythological variety. Flish is a typical formation having these uh, conditions. Molasses also the same, heterogeneous formation. The main characteristic is an alternation which uh, goes inside the scale of the engineering project. Alternation of uh, strong rock, usually sandstone, uh, alternating with uh, a weak rock, uh, usually sealstone or shale or mull. Well, flish uh, uh, is associated uh, with the orogeny. Uh, it is uh, deposited in uh, the sea in the foreland basin of a developing orogeny. Here is the flish. The sea, just look at this column. The sea and the development of orogeny, the squeezing, tectonically squeezing the formation of this material. So, flesh had already heterogeneity plus the tectonic deformation. Molasses is uh, behind and uh, uh, rather in the quiet environment. Formation after the orogeny, from the material eroded from that orogeny. For instance, a typical section in northern Greece. Uh, you have fleece, as it stands today, very much deformed, and molasses behind in a more quiet environment. Uh, this, similarity in tecton in, uh, this similarity in lithology, uh, but a very big difference in tectonic history, has a dramatic result in the behavior in the engineering structure. But typical fleece alternations with similar participation. And from that, you go to the deformed conditions. Uh, anisotropy, now we can consider reasonably isotropy, like that. In depth, you don't find the confinement you could expect in terms of the structure. Since everything was so much compressed, the bedding planes had uh, already seared themselves among the bedding planes and still are existing. They are not virgin there. So the structure is kept weak in such a way, also in depth. This is 180 meters under the surface. Or less. This is about 40 meters under the surface. The box is the left. You have the molasses, but it's quite confined. There is sandstone and sealstone in the same box. And after a few months, exposed on the surface due to the slaking, you see where, the, where is the sealstone and where is this, the sandstone. But uh, so it's quite 
quite a difference. You have again the same lithology, alternation, but due to the tectonic <coughs> conditions now here. In depth, fleece, you can see the layers, and more or less compact. There are a bit of sealstone there, sandstone, another sealstone, but the bedding plates are also more virgil. They are not released due to this confinement. Uh, based on many, many, many data uh, from uh, ma based on many data from uh, uh, many tunnels uh, in uh, northern Greece, and uh, also uh, getting uh, data from other tunnels of similar material around the world, we produced a chart in 2001 with um, Everett Cook from Flish. <coughs> Vasilis Marinos, uh, in his PhD, having many, many data now is many, many data from uh, 70 tunnels, uh, most of them in Flish make a lot of analysis and he developed, he, he adjusted the initial uh, chart, modified some boxes, correct some others, and this is what it stands today. Here, this part, these two lines, anisotropy is present, and you apply, uh, we discussed on that. But here, is anisotropy <coughs> is almost lost. The question here also, you have sigma CI and MI. Uh, so you have to balance. To balance regarding the participation of each of these material, the strong and the weak one, in your rock mass. Uh, but also, by experience, there is a proposition to make some kind of further reduction besides the uh, weighted uh, mean values, as it is shown in this. And so far, it works quite well, as we receive also the messages uh, from uh, around the, the world when they apply this chart. This is more or less. The appearance is the same, alternations. But no, this was compact. You use the chart at the upper part. And uh, if it's a weak behavior, internally, this is due to the sigma CI. So you go to the lab test, you get, you get these values. Well, if it is uh, brecciated, of course, this is another issue. So the differences. Huge difference in design, absolutely huge. And now we reach the conclusions, and we conclude for design. So as I said in the beginning, chemical engineering have to work within the limitation of available technology, and some of the most severe limitations are associated with the estimation of the rock mass properties. Efforts to overcome have resulted in tools such as the GSI classification or characterization, which at this moment can be regarded as interim solution, but it works. This effort has been in most cases useful since there are very few practical alternative available. Uh, alternatives available. It's a good choice for design employing numerical tools in most cases. The GSI classification, the associated Hook and Brown failure criteria being empirical tools should be used interactively during design and uh, the input parameters should be adjusted and refined as back analysis information from actual field behavior becomes available. In, in some cases, it may be <coughs> necessary to develop project specific GSI charts in order to permit classification of rock masses that have not been adequately covered in published papers. And indeed, as we have seen, such a form of rock mass characterization as the GSI has considerable potential for use in rock engineering because it permits the manifold aspects of rock to be quantified and has geological logic even in extremely heterogeneous and complex geological formations. Fortunately, with development in computer hardware and software technology, there is a reasonable expectation that some of the mysteries of rock mass property estimation may be dispelled in the next decade. This expectation is centered in our rapidly improving ability to incorporate laboratory determined intact rock and discontinuity properties into numerical models. <laughs> we look forward to the time when this Numerical tools will allow us to at least calibrate better, if not replace some of the empirical methods, such as the GSI classification and the Hook and Brown criterion that we use today. Thank you. <laughs>